It's time for some more Dr. Ben Miles, specifically his short on the true story of the Demon Core. This is one of the deadliest objects hmm. mankind has ever produced. That's a bit hyperbolic. The Demon Core was certainly dangerous, and there were two tragic accidents. But calling it one of the deadliest objects ever is an exaggeration. I mean, after all, there are devices that were designed to be more dangerous. I know it was initially designed for a nuclear bomb, but even on the scale of nuclear bombs, it wasn't even that dangerous compared to more dangerous ones that would be developed in the future in terms of yield of the weapon anyway. But ultimately, its lethality is tied to how it was handled not an intrinsic property of the device. In nuclear power plants, we always talk about having respect for the energy that you are working with. The Demon Core. Welcome to a series that I'm calling Scientifically Interesting Ways to Die. In 1945, during the final days of World War II, scientists at the Manhattan Project created a six kilogram sphere of plutonium, tended for a third atomic bomb. The so that's true, it was part of the plutonium stockpile. I've heard some of the estimates on the mass vary by a few percentage, but the important takeaway is that it was a near critical mass of plutonium configured for fast neutron fission, which is the sort of design you want for a weapon. Ended before it could be deployed, but left behind became an object of deadly scientific curiosity. Yes, this was to study how close critical assemblies could be pushed without actually going critical. It was informative and in research back then, but Man, it was dangerously managed. One night, Manhattan Project physicist Harry Daglian was working alone in his lab, trying to better understand how to reduce the mass of plutonium needed to reach criticality. And here is your first sign of danger is working alone. Modern criticality experiments require formal procedures, multiple trained personnel with peer checkers, independent verifiers, and supervisory oversight, and remote tools if you're going to be doing something like edging a plutonium core. Jacqueline was manually stacking tungsten carbide bricks around the core to reflect neutrons back inside and increase the core's reaction rate. So reflectors reduce the amount of fissile material needed for criticality by reflecting the escaping neutrons back into the core. It's one of the key components of core design, whether it be for a power reactor or for a weapon. It's one of the reasons why these cores were spherical. Uh, it's to maximize the geometry, so you don't have to deal with corners and maximize the probability of interaction. You could theoretically, the ideal case would be to manufacture a spherical reactor vessel for a power plant, but it's just not worth machining that sort of stuff. Cylindrical vessels are perfectly good enough. But yes, uh, tungsten carbide was both a reflector and an absorber. Positioned the final brick, the neutron detectors in the room began to alarm. Core was approaching supercriticality, potentially turning science experiment into atom bomb. Okay, so he's right that, yeah, it caused some radiological alarms, but they approached prompt criticality. Supercriticality is actually less extreme than prompt criticality. Supercriticality, you're talking raising reactor power. So when you say you take a reactor critical when you're starting up, you're actually just raising power. Prompt criticality, on the other hand, is an uncontrolled, exponentially growing neutron population on the time scale of prompt neutron, which are produced in the fraction of a microsecond, compared to delayed neutrons, which are produced on the order of milliseconds to seconds. So a nuclear reactor, when it goes critical, it's delayed critical, or just plain critical. That is to say, you require the delayed neutrons to sustain the fission reaction, and it's way more controllable. But prompt criticality, to add to that, it will produce an intense burst of neutrons and gamma radiation. It will not produce a weapons-grade explosion in a laboratory setup. The geometry and mass were not configured in such a way to produce a nuclear explosion, despite the fact that, this, that that's what this device was originally planned for. But the radiation output 
is catastrophic to nearby personnel. In the rush to pull his hands away, the brick slipped from his grasp and fell directly into the assembly. Blue flash of light filled mm. the room as an intense burst of radiation ionized the air around him. Another thing reactor operators are taught are to maintain positive control of everything they interact with especially when you're interacting with a core. So yes, that brick falling did trigger a nearby critical geometry and triggered a prompt critical pulse. The blue flash is often described in accounts of this accident. It's a fleeting luminescence from ionized air, like you said, and energetic charged particles such as bremsstrahlung, radiation, which is breaking radiation from particles slowing down, and localized excitation. It's not a mini nuclear fireball, but definitely a visible symptom of radiation interacting with air. Desperate to stop the reaction, Daglian was forced to disassemble part of the reactor sidewall, and in the process received a massive dose of radiation. It had to be 5.1 sieverts to his hands alone. Yeah, he did try to stop it, but... It happens so quickly. There is a unit for the speed of these reactions called a shake. A shake is 10 nanoseconds. As in the light just barely had time to uh, reach his eyes. Interestingly enough, a light nanosecond is about 30 centimeters. But especially taking human reaction time into account, there's just no way. Most automated reaction time isn't that fast. I've heard dose numbers vary, but what is definitely a fact is he did receive a fatal acute exposure with localized high dose to his hands as well as a lethal whole body dose. 5.1 sieverts, maybe, to just to the hands. To give you a sense, anywhere from four to six, even with medical attention to, to the whole body, looking at an LD5060, which is 50% of the population gone within 60 days, and 10 to the whole body, it's almost guaranteed. Right away, his hands began to blister, and waves of nausea swept his body, us, the early signs of radiation sickness. He was rushed to the local hospital, where he fought for 20 days as his bodily functions collapsed around him. That's Ultimately, sad. the damage done in the exposure was too much, and he became the first ever victim of a criticality incident. So extremely high localized doses would indeed produce blistering and necrosis. Whole, the whole body exposure would give the acute radiation syndrome. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of immune system, loss of bone marrow, and you'd last maybe days to weeks if doses exceeded a few sieverts to the whole body. He lasted about a month, a horrific month. But the demon core wasn't finished. Nine months later, There's physicist Louis Slotten was using a beryllium dome to reflect neutrons back into the core, and to avoid the core going supercritical against basically every rule of lab safety and common sense, he propped it open with a screwdriver. Yes, so he was using two beryllium hemispheres, the reflector or a tamper, as described in some weapon designs, and this deliberately risky hands-on hands procedure with a screwdriver is horribly accurate to what happened, and you just wonder what people were thinking back then. Even back then, the idea of using a screwdriver seems far-fetched, but it did indeed happen. You can kind of guess where this story is going. During this particular experiment, the screwdriver slipped and the dome fell, and another brilliant blue flash of light filled the lab. Slotin immediately pulled the dome away, ending the reaction, but not before a massive burst of radiation hit everyone in the room. At least he wasn't alone this time, but the fact that everyone agreed to go on with the crazy screwdriver experiment is still baffling to me. I know that radiation safety standards didn't exist yet, but still, they at least knew about the first accident. I mean, the supercritical interval was very short, but he indeed absorbed an enormous dose, and others in the room got significantly high doses as well, but Slotin just lasted a few days. His dose was much higher and more penetrating the geometry of his positioning with the screwdriver was such that he got a much higher dose. Since standing closest, absorbed an estimated 210 sieverts, four times the lethal dose. His head was almost instantly burned down to the muscle and his organs didn't fare much better, with one doctor describing it as if he had received a three-dimensional sunburn to every internal organ. I'm dead. 
So the again, the 210 number varies depending on source, but yeah, it was very large, fatal. The third degree sunburn or the three dimensional sunburn internally, that's not that's really not a bad description for such an extremely high dose. Now he did mention four times what's deadly. I mean, usually 10 is is enough in most cases for uh, for in the case of whole body dose. Targeted doses, it can vary depending on the body part, but 10 whole body, it's a pretty safe bet. But it does stand, but that does scale as to why his survival time was significantly shorter. Within hours, Slotin's body began shutting down, and nine days later, the Corps had claimed its second victim. Following the incident, the Corps was decommissioned and melted down to be used in later in any case, when a core meltdown is the desirable outcome. But forevermore, the story of the Demon Core will stand as an important reminder of why we don't play Jenga with weapons-grade plutonium. Yes, so these accidents expose several systemic failures, inadequate procedural constraints, inadequate tooling, horrible human factors design, I mean, again, the screwdriver, and a culture that tolerated risky hands-on tests. Modern criticality safety uses written and enforced procedures, remote rigs and interlocks, they don't even have people in the room, multiple observers, training, and formal hazard analysis. After these incidents, Los Alamos moved to remote, mechanized critical assemblies, thankfully. Strict two-person rules, mechanical interlocks to prevent this sort of thing from happening, and this led to maturity of nuclear safety, especially criticality safety. But these sorts of things are why the nuclear industry has safety as robust as it is. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.